Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Paranjay Guhathakurta, eminent journalist and also one of the petitioners in the 2G case in front of the Supreme Court. It has been argued for quite some time that the finance ministry was really not involved in fixing the issue of the license fee and it did not give its concurrence to Raja's uh, position that this should be given on a first come first serve basis on the 2001 prices. It's been argued that Mr. Chidambaram and Raja had met but no concurrence was really given and no minutes were kept out of this. Though Raja has argued in different places and made statements that Chidambaram was fully involved, he had concurred with the prices, he had concurred with the 2001 prices being accepted and there was really no final difference between Chidambaram and Raja on this. What does the current report indicate? I think we have to take a little more nuanced view of the issue. Because clearly what has now happened in the 2G scam case is that the spotlight is on Mr. Chidambaram. We have to first look at the circumstances that led to the award of licenses on the 10th of January 2008 and then look at what happened thereafter. Moreover, it's also very important to, in this case at least, distinguish between the ministry and the minister. In the weeks and the months before the award of the licenses or the letters of intent, I should say, on the 10th of January 2008, there is evidence that Mr. D. Subarao, who was the then finance secretary, who is currently the governor of the Reserve Bank of India, Dr. Subarao had written a series of letters to his counterpart in the Department of Telecommunication, that is Siddharth Bhagura, uh, uh, before him. Mr. Mathur. So Mr. Subara was writing to his counterpart in the DOT and what he had clearly indicated that the manner in which each license was sought to be valued because it's not just a piece of paper it's not just a license because bundled with that license was spectrum electromagnetic spectrum which was very very precious which was very very scarce to price it at 2001 rates when it was discovered by an auction was in the opinion of Mr. Subarao and the officials of the Ministry of Finance clearly not on. He says that either you pub have public auction or you have some sort of an indexation of market mechanism to derive its true market value. Now what happened thereafter was the DOT under Mr. Raja overruled every objection of the Ministry of Finance and went ahead and gave its, awarded those letters of intent. Now this is what happened, now what happened after that? It now subs subsequently transpires that there were meetings that took place between Mr. Raja and Mr. Chidambaram in the presence of Mr. Behura, who's in jail, and Mr. Subarao, their secretaries wherein it was mentioned in the minutes, the same meeting which was supposed to be not minuted. But now those minutes indicate that the finance minister said in that note that he is not seeking to revisit the situation that prevailed. Even at that stage, it was just letters of intent. The government could theoretically have stalled that process, but it did not. Because the finance minister chose not to revisit the process. The issue that really comes out is the fact that not only Mr. Chidambaram overruled his secretary, which is of course he is well within his powers to do, but he also publicly, at least his colleagues in parliament, said that no notes were kept of the meeting and no formal minutes were issued. It now transpired, now it transpired that, is, that is not the that case. Is there were the indeed case. records of the meeting that meeting. took place. It's not that meetings, on all meetings are necessarily minuted, but in this case, this meeting was minuted. Because we also have the Prime Minister's office involved in this and we have Mr. Pulok Chatterjee's meetings also, yes. You know, what is coming out is something very, very curious. It also explains why the government went out of its way to ensure that the Public Accounts Committee, the first draft report that was prepared by Dr. Mulli Manohar Joshi was not adopted by the, uh, the committee and by a very thin margin. There were 21 members, 11 members opposed it, 10 members supported it. And the same Mr. Mulli Manohar Joshi is now trying to have another report, but in that report, 
he was critical of Mr. Chidambaram's role, saying that he tacitly approved. He may not have explicitly approved. Now, what happened thereafter? The Prime Minister himself has acknowledged in his media interviews that initially there was divergence of views between the Department of Telecommunications and North Block, which is the headquarters of the Ministry of Finance. Thereafter, he says there was a concurrence of views. Now, how exactly was there a concurrence of views when the secretaries of the two departments clearly differ and here you have the minister eventually overruling his secretary. There's one other interesting uh, sort of sub-theme of this whole thing. In an interview, Mr. Chidambaram had said that they were waiting for a meeting of the Telecom Commission to take place. And in that Telecom Commission meeting, his secretary, Mr. Subarao, would have participated. But before that Telecom Commission meeting took place, the letters of intent were issued on the 10th of January 2008, almost preempting that process. So once again, we are finding a big question mark. Mr. Chidambaram said he didn't know that this would happen. Thereafter, and this is very interesting, the Prime Minister's office says that an arm's length distance should be maintained. And we have an interview given by Dr. Montek Singh Aluwalia, the Deputy Chairman of the Planning Commission, to Mr. Karan Thapar, saying that, you know, when there are two ministries have disagreements, eventually the view of the ministry which has mooted the proposal prevails. Now, this is strange logic. <laughs> All along, we, uh, we, have, we have been told that actually the Ministry of Finance is, is, is the big boss. The Minister of Finance is the big boss and he can actually overrule. And there are hundreds of instances where the Ministry of Finance has overruled proposals of other ministries. Even aside, the correct rules of procedure is if the ministers have a disagreement, they have to either go to the full cabinet or to an empowered group of ministers. Absolutely This is correct. really the procedure. And in this case, the law ministry headed by Mr. Hans Raj Bhardwaj at that point of time, had suggested that since there was a difference of view between the Ministry of Finance and the Department of, uh, uh, Department of Telecommunications, there should be an empowered group of ministers. The point is, it was not only not referred to an EGOM, it was not even taken up by the Cabinet Committee on Economic Affairs. And thereafter, Dr. Aluwalia, in his interview to Karan Thapar, said that this must not be construed as... The Prime Minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, turning a blind eye to what was happening. Well, if this is not Nelson's eye, what is it? But leaving that aside for the time being, let's come down no, to... I mean, somebody is being economical with the truth. Absolutely. I mean, let's be very clear about let's that. Let's be very clear that the economist, in this case, Dr. Bontek Singh Andhuwalia, is being economical with the truth. But coming back to the issue which you had raised earlier, the issue of mergers and acquisition. This is an issue on which actually the finance ministry has even better... Uh, locus than on the issue of license fee. And obviously, again, these terms were also modified and agreed to, it appears, in the same cabinet, in the same meeting between Chidambaram and Raja. Essentially, what Mr. Raja did was that after the letters of intent were issued on the 10th of January 2008, roughly three months later, in April that year, Mr. Raja issued an order, Suomoto without taking anybody's consent, changing the rules relating to mergers and acquisitions. And one crucial element of the rule was there should be a lock-in period of three years before the license fee holder could sell its license. Now, once again, here again, we are seeing very, very clever interpretation of the law. One thing is to sell a license. And the other is to dilute the equity of the company which has bought the license. In this case, what we found is that the Unitech, a company in the Unitech group, and another company in, which was earlier called Swan and then became DB Etisalat, these companies, what they did was that they roped in foreign parts. In the case of Unitech, it was Telenor of Norway. In the case of the Balwa DB Realty Group, it was Etisalat of the United Arab Emirates. But what is interesting, I mean, subsequently, of course, there was another similar deal involving the Tata Teleservices and Docomo of Japan. But just sticking for that matter to Swan Stroke DB Etisalat and also the, the Unitech Group, what clearly the 
change in the merger and acquisition rules enabled them to do was to rope in the foreign partners. And what was very interesting, the price at which the foreign partners purchased equity clearly indicated that the value of the spectrum behind that license was seven to ten times higher than what had been paid. And, and, and what is worse is that you are indulging in semantic jugglery by trying to justify what happened by saying this is not sale of a license but dilution of equity. You know, it's a bit like the way in which even the first come first serve system was manipulated. You know, uh, whether it should be the date of ap applying for a letter of intent or whether it should be the date on which you pay the amount of the, the letter of intent or the license fee. It's almost like you shouldn't be selling a resource that belongs to the people of this country, a scarce resource, a national resource, a natural resource in the way in which cinema tickets are sold. That's the first point. But even if you assume that they're selling it and you're standing in the queue and you're about to reach that box office and you said, oh, it's now my turn to get the ticket, suddenly a bunch of goons from the back pull you back from that queue and said, no, the guy behind you will get the ticket. But that's how the system was grossly abused and manipulated. And there is again proof to some proof to show that people were sitting in uh, Mr. Raja's antechamber and became number one on the in the queue. But really now what we are seeing are really, what shall I say, the more sophisticated nuances being expressed. And what and is selling, what is dilution of equity, and, 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 probably and also the, the issue, what is an associate precisely. company, what is not an associate company, that Swan was really a part of ADAG group, just as also Loop Telecom was a part of SR, the Rui. See, once again, we are seeing uh, a desperate government trying to use the letter of the law to justify what happened. I, I think what has also rattled the government is the defense that, that Mr. Raja has taken and, and Kani Mohi has taken. I mean, their lawyers have clearly said, firstly, they're saying, please br bring the prime minister, summon the prime minister. That's certainly not a particularly edifying situation to be in. What is more, their lawyers are arguing in court that if what Mr. Kapil Sibyl, the telecom minister, is arguing that there was zero loss, then why the hell are we in jail? If there was no loss to the exchequer, why was there any reason to put them behind bars? And, and the way in which this is all playing out. And, and I think the court will take a very, very proactive role. One is the CBI, in, who, who is it going to now investigate? Is it really going to close its investigations at this juncture? You know, and this whole issue of the associate companies, the definition of who is really an associate company. I'll, I'll give you a classic example on how uh, this whole tiger, cheetah, leopard, zebra was done. You know, suppose you have three companies, A, B and C. A owns 50% of B, B owns 50% of C, C owns 50% of A. So A, B and C claim they are independent corporate entities, not associates. Why? Because neither owns more than 51% of the other and therefore has a controlling interest. But you know, if, we're, if we see the larger picture, Mr. Chidamba, lawyer. We have Mr. Kabil Sibbal, lawyer. Both arguing in different Mr. ways. Mr. Salman Khurshid, lawyer. lawyer. Mr. Virappa Moili, law minister. Okay. So, yeah. you know, you have this entire argument that the government is giving, which is to defend what has happened. That license has been given at very low costs, really at throw away prices. But companies have made a killing by reselling the license, dilution. Yeah, equity they won't call it reselling, dilution, dilution of equity as they're calling it. And then what is it that they are willing to accept has been the problem for which Mr. Raja is in jail that actually procedural lapses took place. So poor man is in jail only for having done procedural lapses. Well, all the money that has been made apparently have been done all in good faith because there has been zero loss to the exchequer. This is really the government's argument. And, and the government's argument, as you rightly pointed out, is sounding so weak, so specious, so hollow that I do not think that we've heard the last about this 2G spectrum scam. And in a way, in a strange way, it's coming back again and again and again to haunt those who are holding very, very important positions, the, the most important positions in the current government. We have a brazen scam followed by brazen defense. Thank you, Varunjay, for coming down here.